Good afternoon, Lung Paul. Good afternoon, uh, John Masoko. Thank you for taking some time to do a new Q&A session. It's been a while. We've been traveling a lot. So uh, I don't remember last time we recorded one of these. So today is Thursday, the 10th of August, 2023. And I would like to ask you to if you would be willing to say a few words about space. I'm aware that you have used space as a contemplation in your practice and got quite a lot of, derived quite a lot of benefit from that. Could you speak about that, please? Well, space is always here and now, wherever you are, you're in space. <clears throat> so it's not something subtle or something quite obvious, but oftentimes seen in very limited ways, like a small space or a big space. We judge space by the size of a room or a hotel or a cabin. <clears throat> or a kuti, and uh, so when we think of a, my kuti in, my, in Thailand, uh, when I first did, went there to live in Nana Chat, was a small space. <clears throat> but space also is where, you know, if there is no space, there'd be no forms. So space is a kind of metaphor for everything because it, it, it gives us perspective on the relationship of form to space. Like in, in for this, for example, right now, we are, these forms, your body and my body are in this space and then in an hour or so we move to another space. The forms come and go in space. But space doesn't come and go, it's, it's here and now. And that's important to, to establish mindfulness in, the, in something quite obvious as space. Because it is, uh, you know, it's what, where time can manifest and where time and birth and death can manifest where things manifest, good and bad, right and wrong, big and small, and, and space is, you know, spacious, it doesn't have any limits. So in terms of Theravada Buddhism, probably Buddhism is uh, one of the immeasurables. You can't measure space, because there's no limit in terms of uh, of how we perceive it. We can't see the end of space. The sun and the moon, the stars, the galaxies are in space. So it, it's an important reflection on the relationship of, of, of form, the earth, fire, water, and air elements could not possibly manifest if you know the space is an absolute necessity for them to manifest to become so then space is you know because it is neutral it is when you meditate on space you know you, you just recognize it's spacious that's it's if you want to say a quality a, a quality is it is that it is what it is here and now. So I found in my early years as a monk, uh, I would start creating problems uh, about other monks. Uh, you know, I just, at first, when I first went to live with them, which I saw all monks in a kind of a in a kind of idealistic way and so I, I you know I didn't know their names and uh, 
I hadn't lived with them before. So, you know, give me the benefit of any doubt. I just assumed they were all, you know, ideal Buddhist monks. As I projected uh, this ideal onto Ajahn Chah. But then living in the Sangha, you began to, your habits, one's habits, one's Vipaka Kama is about uh, naming things and judging, you know, giving them qualities, positive or negative. So as the idealism kind of disappeared, you began to recognize that, that these are not ideal bhikkhus. And according to my perception of an ideal monk, uh, you know, I would say this is a monk I like, or this is a good monk, or that isn't a very good monk, or I don't like that one. So in the meditations with Ajahn Chah, you know, I began to recognize, I started giving, I heard, I began to learn their names and, um, and then sitting in meditation, in group meditation, you'd, uh, you know, you'd, the, you, you're, these uh, views and opinions would arise about this monk I approve of and that monk I don't, and beginning to be aware of uh, this um, conversation in my mind of my own particular tendency to like or dislike, approve or disapprove of conditions or phenomena. So then, you know, I became interested in the, in space because it is impersonal. It doesn't belong to anybody. It doesn't have any quality other than spaciousness. It, it, you can't say it's good or bad, right or wrong. You know, it doesn't apply. So I started contemplating the space between monks. And I found, that, you know, that just observing space between things and giving my attention to the, like right now, the space around Ajahn Asoko is, is I'm not kind of dismissing you, but my attention is on the space that you're in is like this. Is it good or bad? Is it personal? Is it is it Ajahn Soko's space? Or you know, we can assume that, that this is my space and that's your space. But that's just based on the forms in the space, because the forms come and go. Then with with the language, you know, and being such a I, uh, a kind of educated person, I had, I was interested in, in uh, labeling everything, wanting to know the names of everything, and uh, making value judgments. And so then I had an insight that, uh, that uh, this grasping of views and opinions and thoughts was, you know, uh, it was out of ignorance or just a habit. That's how I developed as, as a personality was to grasp views and opinions and to want to know the name of everything and, and uh, be, be very confused or upset if I, if I didn't know what it was or what to call it. I remember going with modern art, abstract art, going to the Tate Modern in London, you know, wanting to judge it according to habit patterns, the, the, the artistic displays in the Tate Modern Museum. And, um, you know, then I found, you know, that I would uh, say, this is, this is junk or this is good or why does that silly thing get a prize or, and you know, my, because, you know, I was brought up to see art as form 
with a you know definite form and uh, in, in traditional European art conditioning. So then, because the forms were abstract or or they didn't they didn't fit into my idea of of what art is, I became aware of of that of my of going to an art museum and forming opinions about this is good or this is terrible or whatever, like my tendency to make value judgments of being aware of my thoughts and uh, then trying to stop making value judgments, trying to be fair about everything, trying to understand that Art is, is much more kind of grand than my particular take on it. You know, I could reason it out. I could reason myself into uh, understanding, trying to understand some of the displays in the Tate Modern. And uh, so I would, uh, you know, I wanted to expand my intellect into appreciating modern art, abstract art, because that seemed like a good thing to do. But it was still grasping views and opinions. But then in, in uh, beginning to observe the suffering I create about forming opinions and views about anything and uh, how they prejudice you, how you, how you perceive somebody if you form a, a, a perception of them already or you have a memory of some unpleasant incident in the past or memories, you know, I remember, uh, you know, uh, and when I was in the Navy, a certain officer that I really hated <laughs> and uh, and just beginning to see how you know that had nothing to do with my life here and now as a monk in Wapapong, but it, it you know I could get really wound up with anger and resentment toward this memory of this this uh, naval officer. So I became aware of that. How you know what is this to do with? here and now with the space that I'm in is it, you know, it, the memory it arises and ceases, things come and go in space, the past and the future are all about the perceptions of time that depend on space. If there's no space, oh, there's no time. So, <clears throat> then just using space because it's neutral and it has no boundaries. It's neither beautiful or ugly or anything, but it will accept beauty and ugliness. So you see a beautiful scene of a garden, go to Ash Ridge and admire the rhododendrons and that, but the space around them, when the rhododendrons die and they turn brown and <laughs> you know the forms come and go but the space is always the same no matter what the condition of the garden is so this is this is like reflecting on the way things are and so using space as a as a kind of reflective meditation, I highly encourage, like the, the space between words, you know, so, you know, with words, we, 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 we are habituated with our language, we, we learn our language, our native language, when we're innocent children, we learn to speak according to the, the language we're born into, and, and then we, we, uh, form, uh, you know, our accent all depends on 
how our parents speak and the kind of local accent of the particular part of the country you're from. And then is there a right accent or a wrong accent, you know, so you can, you can form this uh, uh, stupid accent or <laughs> an intellectual accent or proper English, what's proper English? You know, so, so, you know, when you're living in Britain and you're American, you get this sense that we don't, Americans don't speak proper English. But that's another view and opinion. And so, and so English words, whatever, you know, they're, you regard them as properly pronounced or not, they arise and cease in space, in consciousness. So, you know, giving so, so much importance to, to, to the words and then the grammar, because words are not just independent, usually there's, there's a whole grammatical structure that you're encouraged to learn. And so is proper grammar and improper grammar and rap grammar and, <laughs> and all kinds of grammar is so just one word connecting to another word. But just taking one word and then because I can bring up, I can create a word. I can create a nonsensical word or an intelligent word or a stupid word. You know, the words, are, whether they're stupid or intelligent is, is a judgment, but a word arises and ceases and you become aware of it. It arises in, in consciousness, which is spacious. Because consciousness, you know, is where space manifests. If there is no consciousness, there would be no space. There'd be no, if not space, there'd be no forms. So getting back to the ultimate source, of being is consciousness. And so in, in taking space as an object to reflect upon, I began to just notice, like I would take a, a kind of neutral subject, something that didn't create emotion, a positive or negative emotion, just a boring matter of fact statement, like I am a human being. Because that doesn't arouse, when I think I am a human being, doesn't arouse any emotion. <laughs> it's a kind of matter of fact statement. So, uh, so it's a kind of neutral effect. So just, you know, with the English pronoun I, you've just got one letter. And so I would think I, and then I notice the space around it. If you don't say I am, it kind of follows. But if, if you say I am, you, there's space around that. But just the, the English pronoun I is a really quintessential example of how easy it is. Because <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, an, we all can know that word and it's just one letter. So, and when you intentionally think I, you know, it, it is, there's silence. I is a noise you create by thinking just I and then the silence. Being aware of silence, space, consciousness, these are, you know, these are the way out of being trapped, caught into the sticky, sticky web of our thinking patterns and emotional habits. So then, you know, to observe the I and then am, and you know, it's the silence when you just think am, and then a, and then 
human being, then there's nothing. And so you're, you're, you're noticing, you're noting the space between words rather than being caught up in the momentum of thinking habits, views and opinions, concepts. And so this brings out the, you know, you begin to see things in a, you begin to recognize what mindfulness really is. Awareness really, conscious awareness really is, is here and now. And it's silent. But without consciousness, there'd be nothing. And so, you know, getting to the, returning to the source, Lumpa Cha would call it our real home, beginning to, to know what you really, what is your real nature, is silent awareness, here and now. Then you have insight into the path. And so in Theravada Buddhism, the path is, uh, we call it eightfold. So that makes it very complicated, eight, number eight, and then fold. And, and then path itself is a, isn't exactly a, you know, path that goes from one place to another. Where this doesn't go anywhere, it's just here and now. So this is, this is why I encourage uh, people who are interested in meditation to, to, uh, re to reflect, to observe consciousness, which is first, you, you know, you need to look at the, you know, one of the helpful methods is to recognize the relationship of form to space, and then space to consciousness. And so you're getting back to the very source of being, where there's no person. You know, Ajahn Sameto is a, is a name given to me, but in silence of conscious awareness, there's no Ajahn Sameto there, or Robert Jackman. There's fully, fully conscious, you're not in a kind of, semi ambulant stage or in a trance, you're here and now, fully here, now, silent, where space, you can, your, your, your senses still operate, I can still see, hear, smell, taste, touch, thinking arises, and, uh, and then, uh, forms come and go in space. Space doesn't have any preference for what is in it. We say this is a sacred space, but that's a projection we call this space as a Buddha Rupa. And it's, it's a sacred space. That's, a, that's what human beings label as space. But space is not sacred unless we, we designate that word to a particular space, like in the temple or the shrine and so in a church or that, we think it was sacred. But that's a projection of, of that's a concept that we, we have in our language, in our cultural conditioning. The space is neither sacred nor precious, nor good nor bad, right or wrong, it's spacious. That's about all you can say for it. And then, and then uh, you know, the, I would uh, contemplate the Buddha Rupa in the temple here at Amravati. And I was thinking of the Buddha Rupa as a large golden figure on the shrine. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of beautiful icon of mindfulness, of a human form that is silent and aware, not passing judgment on anybody. So I remember 
this my condition name, my cultural condition name would still operate, you know, in terms of uh, a big golden form in, on a shrine. And, uh, you know, it's brought up as a Christian where you're not supposed to bow down to golden images. And here I am in England bowing down to a golden image. That, those kind of memories, the perceptions will still arise. And then being a Buddhist monk, you've got all these precepts, Vinaya precepts. And so you're very conscious and aware of, of keeping the precepts properly, being moral, being right, being righteous. And so I remember sitting in front of the, the Buddha Rupa and, and the, the mudra is a, the hand is like this, you know, so, so I, uh, I began to recognize that I felt judgment from the Buddha Rupa. You know, is my Vinaya perfect or have I, sometimes my language isn't all that proper. <laughs> sometimes I have unpleasant thoughts in my mind. There I, I break a precept and then sitting in front of the Buddha Rupa, you know, as a judgmental figure, a kind of patriarchal form, male form that, that says you're a naughty boy, you're, you're a bad monk. So just recognizing how the form of the Buddha Rupa, you know, this, this kind of gigantic figure, golden figure in front of me, and, and how I could project onto it and as a Vinaya judge, a moral judge, because that's how oftentimes Christians, Christianity conditioned you to think of God as making value judgments about you all the time. And so I thought, no, that's a sign of blessing. The Buddha is blessing me. So just changing the perception from judgment to blessing. <laughs> you know, quite consciously and deliberately doing that. And then I think, this Buddha Rupa doesn't really care what goes on in this space. You know, you could have a war, sexual encounters, uh, you can bow down everybody being uh, uh, respectful or disrespectful, but the Buddha doesn't, doesn't change, you know, it's this total awareness here and now. And so then seeing Buddha as a blessing rather than as a, a patriarchal judgmental father figure, that, now that judgmental patriarchal father figure is from the cultural conditioning I, I had. Where, you know, being able to recognize that, that that's conditioning, it's not true, but it's how we've decided to designate right and wrong, good and bad. So, you know, you're brought up in a, in like these, uh, Born again Christians, evangelicals have very strong moralistic views about what's right. Or like in, now in Florida with Ron DeSantis, <laughs> don't say gay and things like this are, are, you know, forming views out of some kind of righteous sense of morality, which oftentimes is very brutal. And, and because it's so judgmental and, and uh, black and white, it's either right or wrong, good or bad. But good and bad, right and wrong, heaven and hell arise and cease in space. Hell is in space. Heaven is in space. So what isn't in space is consciousness. 
Space is a, in consciousness. Consciousness is not in space. So you begin to begin to see things as they really are, rather than as you've been told and what you've been conditioned to believe in, as how things should be, right or wrong. So in uh, modern life, it's a very interesting time where everything's being challenged like the LGBTQ questions and, uh, you know, the, suddenly these issues about sexuality become very prominent in uh, modern life. And, and some, some people see them as bad, some people see them as good, some people don't really care whether they're good or bad, they're just what they are, but <clears throat> these are conditioning re reactions to those words. So the word gay, when I was a child, meant happy. It didn't have the connotation it does now. If it's gay, it's kind of a celebratory gay time, and, and uh, Paris is gay, and <laughs> and on and on like this. And now it has definite meaning. That is, is, doesn't necessarily convey happiness, but it is, it, it, it's how we use that three-letter word in modern jargons, and it's the creation of the mind of ignorant human beings. So is it right or wrong? Is it immoral? And these are value judgments that human beings make. This is not Dhamma. It is a form, it is an action that rises and ceases. Is it, does it, is it harmful? Is it, you know, and things like, you know, we can see things as, uh, like judging, crim uh, punishing criminals, and thieves, and so forth. But we also project onto all kinds of conditions that are quite harmless, or even quite good, a kind of moral judgment, because they don't fit into our rigid standards of what's moral, what's right, and what's wrong. Now, when you abide in, in, the, in the source of awareness, conscious awareness, you begin, you begin to see things as they are and, and see how conditioning operates. How, how condition, you know, how you, you, you're conditioned as a child and you're kind of an open book Anything can be written on the empty pages. <laughs> and you, you don't have the experience of life or the wisdom to, to see through it. So you're just like an innocent means of just, you're just like a sponge, you absorb everything. And so uh, it can be right or wrong, good or bad, skillful or unskillful. But then in, as we mature, then the wisdom begins to, uh, you know, become critical, become aware of, of a lot of the prejudices that we've been conditioned by, like racial prejudices. These are rampant now issues of great importance, you know, because people are conditioned to, to have strong views about African Americans or black people or Latinos or Asians or strong views about women or men. These are all, you know, views and opinions that are created out of our experience of life, how we tend to see and experience uh, through the senses, through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. But as we abide in our true nature, in, our, in the source of being, suddenly these no longer become issues. 
everything ceases. And when you let everything cease, let go of the world, let go of everything, you're not destroying anything, but you're liberating yourself from the conditioning you've acquired, that you assumed from early childhood and onward. You see racial prejudice as a, as a, you know, as a condition arising and ceasing, not a, a reality, not something that you want to move on, speak on, or take action from. So you begin to relax and, and, and enjoy the, the world that we experience or see it no longer with fear and bias and prejudice, but from a kind of, from, a, from ultimate freedom of conscious awareness here and now. And you, you, you are the witness to the space and forms that you experience through your senses. So generally, <clears throat> generally, the way you speak about space is a very reflective and investigative way. It's not using space, forgive the pun, but it's not using space to just space out into space. It's not just zoning out into it. It's really using it as a, a way to notice the background in which everything arises and then step by step you're taking that all the way to the ultimate background yeah. which is consciousness is that correct because mm. consciousness and space are you know is is about here and now it's not about the past or the future what is past consciousness? <laughs> what? How will I be conscious? In it? Will I be conscious when I die? When when this body dies, drops dead? What will happen to my consciousness? And so we. And what am I doing when I say this? My consciousness. When my body dies, then I'm dead. What happens to my consciousness? And so then you get caught in doubt or you form opinions about it. it goes to, if you've been good, you go to a heavenly realm. If you've been bad, you get punished. Or maybe it just, it's just oblivion, nothing, kind of a total annihilation. But um, those are project words we project onto the, the doubt about what happens to my consciousness when the body dies. And then there are certain views and opinions about that. Uh, you know, about what happens after death. And, and uh, but there's still views and opinions that are creations, that are sankharas, that are phenomena. So you begin to see all phenomena as empty, because that's what it is. Heaven, the word heaven, you know, it brings up a certain emo um, memory or a wish or a certain desire. Heaven sounds wonderful, you know, for, for a human being to live in a perfectly beautiful, pleasant, perfect, heavenly realm, uh, you know, that's, that's the desirable. And then hell is what we fear, you know, then they describe different levels of hell that you go to if you've beaten your wife or if you've robbed a bank or <laughs> told them you're a liar, <laughs> have been an adulterer, you go to a certain kind of awful place. <laughs> And these are, these are images we create in our mind with words. But you're not, you, you no longer 
believe in the words as your reality. You know that the words I am a human being are, are creations of human individuals. They arise and cease and you can witness by deliberately thinking, but not to be caught up in forming views and opinions or trying to understand everything with the intellect, but just be the observer of it, the witness, the eyes like this. And so, and, uh, because we don't observe the space between the words. And silence is something, you know, not socially ac acceptable. On a meditation retreat, you want everybody to be silent, so you tell them <laughs> to keep noble silence. And, uh, and that's a, in a special situation, but generally speaking, in social, social situation, you go to a dinner or a meeting and everybody talking away. <laughs> and then the, suddenly the conversation drops and you feel this desperate need to talk about something. <laughs> that's polite behavior, social behavior, according to various views and opinions. But, you know, consciousness is here and now. It's not a, not a creation. The word consciousness is a creation. But we, the, we're, the reality of here and now is consciousness. And then, uh, then uh, the space and the forms are what we become interested in, not in just being silent and aware, but in in the whether you know the who we're with, the season of the year, the weather, views and opinions, crises, relationship problems and on and on like wars and and all kinds of fears and anxiety of life right now and listening to media the mass media it's very upsetting climate change and war and and uh, strong views and opinions stubborn views about right and wrong and uh, kind of going back to the past trying to to make America great again, or Great Britain great again, or <laughs> declare our independence. We don't, we're the greatest in the world. We don't need the rest of the world, or, uh, you know, it forms a kind of fanatical views. Some are very good views, like we should all unite and work as a, to help each other develop and feed the pop world's population. These are, these are grand views, beautiful views, but you know, they, otherwise we can be very nationalistic, very patriotic, and and keep the Latinos out of Texas, <laughs> and stop the Haitians from coming to Florida. <laughs> uh, you know, we got to. You know, we can be violent in in our views and opinions, or we can be very grand liberal. So there's the right and the left, the liberals and the uh, fascists and on and on like that. So you, you know, these are words that we use. But uh, people aren't aware of what they're thinking and they aren't aware of the, their true nature. They're operating from conditioning, like puppets on a string. They can't help thinking the way they do and having the prejudice and biases because that's how they've been conditioned. <clears throat> and they've been brought up maybe in a society where everybody reinforces those prejudices and views. Where, 
with meditation, bhavana, you begin to, no matter how biased or prejudiced you may be, you know, be a condition like me, you begin to see through it. You're no longer caught, just a kind of helpless victim of what you got when you were a child from your parents, from your social group, from your nationality, your gender. Your true nature is is absolutely pure. Consciousness that doesn't have any, you know, even saying it's pure is saying too much. But, you know, purity, what is that? That's a, an ideal that, you know, uh, that we create with the word, is it pure or adulterated, uh, you know, or natural or unnatural, the word plastic now. <laughs> I remember back in the 50s, plastic was a plastic, and now plastic's plastic, and this plastic is no good. You know. It's polluting the planet. So we, we've got all these these uh, views and opinions about life that change. But no matter whether we like plastic or don't like plastic, it is a view and opinion that we begin to recognize as the, just that. It's not that we shouldn't have views and opinions, but but the grasping of them creates the wars, creates endless conflicts, irreconcilable relationship or breaking of relationship, misunderstandings, hurt feelings, all that over views and opinions and the way we grasp and identify with them. Where in pure consciousness, there's no identity. There's no language to identify with. So it's freedom, ultimate freedom here and now. And this uh, Buddha was very, you know, in his teaching after his enlightenment is pointing to that. You know, saying this is the direction, you know, to, how to deal with the conditioning you have. Not to get rid of it, but to understand that you're not a condition. You're not a limited form. You're not bound to a sticky web of biases and prejudices and views and opinions. You're not just a social puppet on a string. You know, you. This is what we all are, is with this consciousness, which is unitive. So then, like yesterday's talk about the Brahma Viharas, that's where these begin to, begin to really make sense in terms of experience. Because it's not, not me as a Buddhist monk, as Sumedho Bhikkhu, who's spreading metta, or feeling compassion, or being joyful at the goodness of others, or trying to make myself economist. It's not me doing that as a person, as a physical body, as a personality. Because letting go of that, the body is self, the personality is not self. You see, you know, you find your what you really are is this conscious awareness, formless. And we can call that metta or love, you know, unconditioned love. You can call it upeka or equanimity. Like silence is, is equanimous. Metta is, is uh, love, it, uh, unconditional love, so it's not judgmental. It's not judging things about, well, conditional love is very judgmental. And then the natural 
human ex experience of being having a human body, male or female, here and now, then compassion comes from wisdom, not from idealism or just emotional habits. And sympathetic joy, mudita, it isn't kind of trying to feel joy at the goodness of others or the beauty of nature. It's not me trying to, to create the positive feelings about things. But it's, it's spontaneous, spontaneity. So these four Brahma Viharas are spontaneous experiences through this awareness of the way things are, the Dhamma. Thank you very much, Nicole.